a serial killer, psychopath and pathological liar. Joanna Dennehy described herself as a monster with a Moorish taste for blood. She was charged with one murder and the two attempted murders. In March 2013, the quiet English town of Peterborough was shaken by a shocking series of murders. Over the course of 10 days, three local men were viciously stabbed to death and left discarded in the watery ditches on the outskirts of the town, dubbed the Peterborough Ditch murders by the media. These killings appeared to be motiveless and random acts of savagery, yet they were all committed by the same perpetrator, an unassuming young woman named Joanna Dennehy. Miss Dennehy's spree of violence highlighted that women are capable of crimes just as chilling as their male counterparts. Her actions defied stereotypes about the fairer sex and she joined the ranks of Britain's most notorious female serial killers. This intelligent yet emotionally disturbed killer specifically targeted men to satisfy her sadistic urges. After her arrest, she boasted that she found the murder Moorish and fun. The Peterborough Ditch murders provide a case study of a psychopathic mind. Miss Dennehy possesses the classic traits, lack of empathy, remorse, guilt and emotional depth. Her story reveals the danger posed by those unable to feel compassion for others. But it also prompts difficult questions about how such individuals can be identified and stopped before it's too late. This story will delve into the background motives and psychology behind Miss Dennehy's 10 days of murder. It will reconstruct the police manhunt which eventually brought her to justice. More importantly, it will tell the stories of the victims whose lives were so brutally cut short by this callous killer. Their names must not be forgotten as we try to comprehend how and why such shocking crimes could unfold in an otherwise peaceful English town. The morning of March the 29th, 2013 began like any other for a resident of Peterborough, a peaceful English town in Cambridgeshire. But by nightfall, the community would be rocked by the discovery of a brutal murder on its outskirts. This was only the first sign of horror that had been unfolding in the mists over the past 10 days at the hands of Joanna Dennehy. Miss Dennehy's first victim, Lukas Slabowski, had been killed eight days earlier. The 31-year-old Polish national had met Miss Dennehy just days before his murder. She had nicknamed him her expectant victim and lured him to a property with the promise of sexual favours. Once there, she mercilessly drove a pocket knife into his heart before storing his lifeless body in a wheel bin, leaving behind a wife and two children. Her next target was to be housemate John Chapman, a 56-year-old Falklands veteran who lived in the same rundown bedsit as Miss Dennehy in Peterborough. High on drink and drugs on the evening of March the 29th, he was ruthlessly stabbed in the neck and chest as Miss Dennehy told an accomplice, oops, I've done it again. His body was callously dumped in a ditch on the outskirts of the town. That same evening, Miss Dennehy murdered her third victim, her landlord and lover, 48-year-old Kevin Lee. She stabbed him in the heart and dressed his corpse in a sequined black dress before leaving it to rot in Newborough. Mr. Lee had considered Miss Dennehy a close friend as well as a lover, utterly oblivious to the danger she posed. Over the course of 10 days, Miss Dennehy had murdered three men who trusted her, each stabbed repeatedly in a ferocious, sustained attack. Her victims had been horrifically violated and discarded like trash. But even after this vicious killing spree, Miss Dennehy's bloodlust had not been sated. Two more men would soon be fighting for their lives against the blade of this remorseless killer. As the news spread of the bodies discovered in the ditches outside Peterborough, police launched a frantic nationwide manhunt to find their killer. The three victims, Lucas Slabowski, John Chapman and Kevin Lee appeared to have been randomly targeted, leaving detectives few leads. But diligent police work would eventually trace the footsteps of Joanna Dennehy's vicious spree across Britain's highways. Officers 
meticulously gathered CCTV footage tracking Miss Dennehy's movement over the next 10 days when she stabbed five men, three fatally. Cameras caught her driving her Vauxhall Astra with accomplice Gary Stretch, who used to be known as Gary Richards, by her side. Miss Dennehy at the wheel, they crisscrossed the country roads of East Anglia to deposit her victims where no one could find them. The biggest break came when Miss Dennehy's car was spotted on CCTV heading west. She had travelled 140 miles away to the city of Hereford, suggesting her killing spree was far from over. Detectives descended upon the city, warning the local populace to be vigilant. Their fears proved justified when two dog walkers were randomly attacked and stabbed in separate incidences. Both seriously injured, both men miraculously survived. Witness descriptions of a crazed young woman wielding a knife led police to finally close in on Miss Dennehy. After going to ground for several days amongst the network of narrow Hereford streets, she and her accomplice, Mr Stretch, were arrested by armed officers. Found in the car was John Chapman's dog, Bonnie, taken by Miss Dennehy after his murder. The pet was traumatised but still alive, having been forced to ride alongside Mr Chapman's lifeless corpse. With Miss Dennehy finally in custody, police could begin to unravel the full extent of her depraved killing spree. But her lack of remorse, or even a clear motive would continue to shock and confuse investigators. The urgent manhunt had succeeded in capturing a killer with a lust for blood before she could claim any further lives. Yet questions remained about what could drive a young British woman to carry out such a brutal and indiscriminate violence against strangers she had only just met. The police had caught her but understanding her would prove to be far more difficult. As details emerged about Johanna Dennehy's early life, they revealed a childhood filled with disturbing warning signs of what was to come. Miss Dennehy grew up in the Herefordshire town of Harpenden, close to St Albans. Her father, Kevin, worked in security and her mother, Kathleen, was a shop assistant. On the surface, it appeared an ordinary lower middle class household. Yet, even as a young girl, Miss Dennehy showed indications of abnormal psychology. She demonstrated a cruel streak, seemingly to enjoy inflicting suffering on others. Neighbours recalled her torturing insects and bullying other children. As a teen, she became increasingly destructive and aggressive. At the age of 15, Miss Dennehy ran away from home without warning, severing ties with her family. She began drifting between temporary jobs and romantic relationships often moving across the country. It was a pattern of transience that would continue into adulthood. Those who knew Miss Dennehy described her as manipulative and deceitful in how she interacted with others. She had a chameleon-like ability to change her persona to get what she wanted before abandoning people once their usefulness had faded. Her parents likened her to a snake shredding its skin. Miss Dennehy went on to have two children from different fathers but showed minimal maternal instincts. She continued abusing drugs and alcohol and her life became increasingly unstable. By the time she committed her infamous murders at the age of 30, any semblance of a normal existence had long since disappeared. After her crimes, Miss Dennehy's parents spoke of their disbelief at the monster she had become. They believed the kind, sensitive girl they had lovingly raised had disappeared forever once she ran away from home. But the seeds of Miss Dennehy's destructive compulsions had perhaps always been there, waiting to fully bloom once the last restraints of family were severed. After her arrest, Johanna Dennehy underwent extensive psychiatric analysis to determine what drove her brutal actions. These sessions with leading experts provided chilling insights into her abnormal psychology and utter lack of normal human emotions. Miss Dennehy was diagnosed with several severe personality disorders which obliterated her ability to feel empathy or remorse. The first was psychotherapy 
which meant she pursued her desires without regard for others and felt no guilt for the damage left in her wake. Psychopaths are skilled at manipulating people but are unable to form real emotional connections. Every relationship is transactional to them. Miss Dennehy also exhibited antisocial personality disorder. Sufferers tend to violate social norms without concern for consequences. They disregard the law lie compulsively and feel no obligation towards others. Miss Dennehy's transient lifestyle and estrangement from her family were hallmarks of this disorder. In addition, she had borderline personality disorder marked by unstable moods, turbulent relationships, impulsivity and fear of abandonment. Her drastic suicide attempts with other inmates played the chaotic emotional patterns of this illness. Most chillingly, Miss Dennehy showed signs of paraphilia sadomasochism. This meant she derived intense sexual excitement from both inflicting and receiving pain and humiliation, causing fear and suffering satisfied her cruel sadistic desires. Miss Dennehy killed for gratification, relishing the control she exerted over her helpless victims in their final moments. Psychiatrists concluded that Miss Dennehy possessed an extreme form of psychopathology. Her combined disorders created the perfect storm to produce a remorseless killer. She lacked a conscience and the rich inner world most of us possess. There was a yawning emptiness inside Miss Dennehy that she attempted to fill with violence. Her crimes enacted the fantasies of a damaged mind. The experts who analysed Miss Dennehy agreed she had no possibility of being cured. Her conditions were lifelong and untreatable. Medication could not instil a conscience or empathy where none existed. The diagnosis confirmed that Miss Dennehy felt no remorse because mentally she was incapable of it. They provided insights but could not fully explain the evolution of a woman who derived deep fulfilment for murder. In November 2013, Joanna Dennehy was brought before the court to answer for her shocking crimes. By this point, her guilt was in no doubt. Miss Dennehy had already confessed to three murders and two attempted murders, yet her continued lack of remorse during the trial proceedings would disturb both judge and jury. Miss Dennehy pleaded guilty to all indictments, but seemed to revel in her day at court. She mocked psychiatrists who attempted to analyse her and flirted openly with accomplice Gary Stretch. I've pleaded guilty and that's that, she arrogantly told the judge when questioned. Victim impact statements from grieving family members left Miss Dennehy yawning in the dock. She showed neither compassion nor any flicker of guilt for the lives she had destroyed. A smirking Miss Dennehy seemed to relish in being the centre of attention. The trial confirmed chilling details of Miss Dennehy's crimes. She had targeted her victims purely for sadistic gratification, comparing herself to Bonnie and Clyde. Afterwards, she callously disposed of the bodies in remote ditches. Miss Dennehy's lack of remorse alarmed psychiatric experts called in to assess her twisted psyche. Justice was finally served in February 2014 when Mr Justice Spencer sentenced Miss Dennehy to life imprisonment at the Old Bailey. He recommended she should never be released, branding her a cruel, calculated serial killer who knew exactly what she was doing. Miss Dennehy merely laughed as the judge detailed her sadistic love for spilling blood and how she gained sexual pleasure from harming others. He concluded this dangerous psychopath could never be rehabilitated. She became the third woman in British history to receive a whole life term. The sentence fittingly punished Miss Dennehy's horrific crimes and brought relief to traumatised family members. But for investigators and criminal experts, many questions remained unanswered. What could have shaped such a cold-hearted killer to devoid of such empathy and remorse? And was Miss Dennehy born a monster or created by the world around her? Joanna Dennehy's cruel crimes demanded that she be removed from society and imprisoned for public safety, but her continued malevolent behaviour behind bars showed that incarceration had done nothing 
to reform this psychopathic killer. After her sentencing in 2014, Miss Dennehy was sent to HMP Bronzefield in Surrey. Almost immediately, she began plotting a daring escape. Her plan involved murdering a female prison officer and using the severed fingers to fool the biometric entry system. The plot was only foiled when guards found the plan scribbled in Miss Dennehy's diary. Such was the danger Miss Dennehy posed that she was kept in solid confinement for over two years. During this isolation, she made several suicide attempts and self-harmed regularly. Miss Dennehy later sued the prison system for human rights breaches over her confinement conditions. Miss Dennehy also made chilling threats against other notorious inmates. When serial killer Rose West was temporarily moved to HMP Bronzefield, Miss Dennehy allegedly vowed to murder her in order to become the top dog. Terrified prison staff quickly had Miss West transferred to another facility. Johanna Dennehy's vicious killing spree lasting just 10 days less scars on the British psych that continued to linger. Her crimes highlighted flaws in the system meant to identify such dangers and tragically cut short the lives of five men. The families of her three murder victims were left devastated by Miss Dennehy's sadistic brutality. Lucas Slabowski's wife and two young daughters were suddenly deprived of a loving husband and father. The Falklands veteran John Chapman and landlord Kevin Lee also left behind grieving relatives. Miss Dennehy's parents spoke of lasting trauma at how their daughter had become a remorseless killer. They believed the happy, caring girl they raised was forever lost once she ran away at age 16. Her father says he will never forgive Miss Dennehy for the heartbreak she has caused. Questions were raised about why probation services had not done more whilst monitoring Miss Dennehy for previous offences. She had already shown violence, yet there were no robust measures to intervene in her downward spiral into murder. The case also highlighted how violent psychopathic women remain far rarer than their male counterparts. Some argue Miss Dennehy deserves greater prominence alongside infamous British female killers like Myra Hindley and Rosemary West. Academics continue trying to unravel Miss Dennehy's complex and disturbing psychology to understand what can lead to such brutal crimes. But for criminologists, no theoretical insights can undo the horrific reality of what her victims suffered. Joanna Dennehy's 10 days of violence shook the nation and left untold damage in their wake. Her name will go down in the annals of infamy beside history's most reviled killers. Yet the loved ones of those she so mercilessly killed will be remembered by their family as far more than just victims of a notorious murderer. The grim story of Johanna Dennehy's murderous rampage leaves us with as many questions as answers. What could have caused a young woman to morph into a cold-blooded killer who took such pleasure in inflicting pain and ending lives? Was Miss Dennehy always destined to become a murderer due to her innate psychology? Or did social failings allow her violent urges to flourish unchecked? Perhaps we will never fully understand what created this monster, but we owe it to Miss Dennehy's victim victims to search for such insight. Only by examining the factors that produce such warped individuals can we hope to prevent future tragedies. It is tempting to dismiss Miss Dennehy as an anomaly, a rare female psychopath not representative of her gender. But we must be vigilant against those who exhibit the warning signs. Early intervention may prevent them from descending into depravity and horror. Miss Dennehy's crimes highlight that women are equally capable of the most chilling evil. Her victims' suffering proves that brutality does not discriminate by sex. We must discard outdated assumptions that females are incapable of merciless violence. As you reflect on this disturbing case, Consider the following. What can be done to identify psychopathic traits in use before it's too late? How can we address the failures in social services and law enforcement that allowed Miss Dennehy's spree? What does Miss Dennehy's pathological lack of empathy and remorse tell us about human nature?
While justice has been served, has society truly learnt the lesson from these chilling crimes? Though she remains unrepentant, we must strive to do better as a society. If evil like Miss Dennehy still lurks in our midst, we are responsible for rooting it out. The soul she stole deserved nothing less. In 2018, Miss Dennehy announced her intention to marry girlfriend and fellow prisoner Haley Palmer. But despite Miss Palmer's release in 2021, the wedding never went ahead. Miss Dennehy continued her relationship with Miss Palmer for some years before it broke down. Throughout her incarceration, Miss Dennehy has remained defiant and unrepentant about her crimes. She passes time baking with fellow inmates but refuses to cooperate with psychologists. Now nearing 40 years old, she seems destined to remain in prison for the rest of her natural life. For the families of Miss Dennehy's victims, her imprisonment provides a measure of justice and protects others from harm. But they continue living with the pain of their loss, while the killer herself feels no such heartache over their lives she so cruelly stole. A serial killer, psychopath and pathological liar. Joanna Dennehy described herself as a monster with a Moorish taste for blood. When earlier this year Dennehy was given a whole life sentence, she joined the ranks of Rosemary West and Myra Hindley as one of Britain's most infamous female murderers. Matthew's story of how she was caught contains some strong language. It was like a river of blood. She just kept coming for me. The most dangerous of people, you can't predict what they're going to do. The story of Joanna Dennehy, the serial killer, is a dark and deeply disturbing one. It begins with a missing man and ends with three dead, their bodies dumped in ditches and two others fighting for their lives. But how did this mother of two become a cold-blooded killer who murdered men for fun? Dennehy grew up in Hertfordshire with her parents and younger sister. Her childhood seems to have been comfortable and ordinary. But in a twisted fantasy, she claimed she'd been abused as a child and even that she'd killed her father. She is obsessed, fascinated by the ability one human has to actually snuff out the life of another. But she wouldn't be satisfied with just the fantasy of murder. On Friday the 29th of March last year, Peterborough landlord Kevin Lee went missing. He was a 48-year-old husband with two children. Within hours of his family contacting the police, a car was discovered on fire. Checks quickly revealed it was his. His car, found as it was ablaze, uh, he not with it, um, was a particular interest to me that there was obviously something underlying that um, that w was stopping him from being in contact with his family. That raised the level of suspicion that I was dealing with more than the missing person inquiry. Their worst fears were soon realised. The body of Kevin Lee was found in a ditch. He'd been repeatedly stabbed in the chest, including through the heart. In a final act of humiliation, he was wearing a black sequin dress pulled up above his waist. The missing person case was now a murder investigation. You're standing literally in the middle of a field, you realise you've got no CCTV, you've got no witnesses. It was evident to me that the answer would be around the people in Kevin's life and Joanne Dennehy was one of them. There was a, sus a suspicion that Kevin was having more than a, a, a friendly relationship with Joanna. Dennehy lived in a shared house in Peterborough, owned by Kevin. She seemed to have a power and influence over some men. They would become obsessed and fascinated by her. 
police decided to bring her in for questioning. It was very evident very quickly that she was making herself very, very hard to find. And she wasn't alone. Detectives linked her to longtime friend, seven foot three inch tall, Gary Stretch. It was clear to me that Dennehy and Stretch were involved in, in Kevin's death. And it was at that point that I took the difficult decision to put both their photographs into the media. Dennehy and Stretch together were a particularly dangerous combination. The pair got a thrill from their status, bragging they were like Bonnie and Clyde. Take a picture for me. They took these pictures while on the run. Officers from forces across the UK were now looking for them and the police were about to get a major breakthrough. A detective in Norfolk was reviewing a theft at a petrol station and gave me that critical missing link, the registration number of a green Vauxhall Astra. Well, that was the absolute golden nugget. The car was traced to Hereford, 140 miles away, an area Stretch had links with, but by now, Dennehy had formed a sick plan. I want my fun. This time, to murder at random. I felt a thump in the back of my shoulder. So I just turned around and there was this girl. She said, I want to hurt you. I want to fucking kill you. <laughs> Kicked her at least twice. Punched her, made no effect, she just kept coming. Dennehy left him for dead, but she hadn't satisfied her lust for blood. Within 20 minutes, she struck again. This time, the attack was even more savage. I mean, the first thought I can remember was well, this is it, you know, this is the day that I die. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe that I would survive because there was just, it was like a river of blood. She was now taking more risks, attacking in broad daylight, but with multiple 999 calls reporting what she'd done, the police were closing in. <coughs> At the very least, in Cambridgeshire, we could show an association between Kevin and Joanna. And this was completely off the scale. Just 19 minutes after John Rogers was stabbed, police had caught Dennehy. She was arrested by officers in Hereford, was completely calm, offered no resistance, and even offered them the knife that she had carried out the attack with. Stretch wasn't in the car, but he was arrested within an hour. She was charged with one murder and the two attempted murders. She's facing an inevitable fate. The cavalier, defiant behaviour that we see in the footage is a desperate last attempt to avoid the consequences, not to have to face up to that. But there were further horrors to come. Two more bodies were found, not far from Kevin Lee's. The sense of shock that went through the incident room when I relayed that to, to my team was palpable. And it was, I guess, that critical moment where we all realised that we were dealing with something extraordinary now. Lukasz Slabozewski would turn out to have been Dennehy's first victim. Originally from Poland, the 31-year-old had only known her for a few days. He was stabbed once through the heart. The second body in the ditch, and also Dennehy's second victim, was 56-year-old John Chapman. He was murdered at the house he shared with her. She stabbed him once in the neck and five times in the chest, including again through the heart. She moves on from a simple, straightforward murder style um, 
to one which is much more frenzied. She's less focused on the um, ultimate destruction of the individual. She's done that, she's experienced that, and she's, she's liberated now to express her full sadistic desires. Only Dennehy knows exactly why she killed. During 14 hours of police interviews, she refused to cooperate. Did you murder Lushkash Slavijewski? Nikon. Did you murder Kevin Lee? Nikon. Did you murder John Chapman? Nikon. But while awaiting trial, she surprised everyone, including her own legal team, by pleading guilty. At the Old Bailey, she laughed, joked and swore in court as she became only the third woman to be given a whole life term. She's in company of Hindley and West um, as female serial killers. The nature of her crimes are, are very different, but just as shocking. She's the only uh, female serial killer I can think of, other than Rose West, who has committed the crimes purely for their own sake, for their own sadistic thrill. Actually, what you've got is, is probably the most dangerous of people. You can't predict what they're going to do. Um, and it's absolutely right that she will die in prison. It's a um. staggering situation. There's a, the why. Was any more understood about the why? No, we don't. Partly because of that late guilty plea. Her sister said it was all about Dennehy trying to control the trial situation. We know she had a pretty normal childhood, doting parents, doing well at school, but by 15 she was beginning to go off the rails. Drink, skunk cannabis, she left home but nothing that fully explains that descent into chaos. I mean, by the end, she certainly loved the notoriety. She's said to have danced around the television when she saw herself in news reports. I spoke to one criminologist who suggested perhaps once the spotlight faded, she'd offer up some sort of explanation because uh, rather like in the way of the Moore's murderer, to keep the focus on here, Ian Brady, control is everything yeah. and the why is the one thing they control. Just briefly, psychologists, the police, did they say she would have got, gone on killing? Oh, undoubtedly, they think the number of attacks would have increased, also the level of violence would have increased. Once she crossed that line, all she wanted to do was kill. There are only two positive. One, the police caught her so quickly. The other is that Joanna Dennehy will spend every day of the rest of her life in a prison cell. Matthew, thank you. Let's go to Martin now. Dennehy wasn't alone. Seven foot three Gary Stretch was her driver and accomplice. Here they are, holding hands at Strencham Services on the M5. It's just before nine in the morning on April the 2nd, and the first sign the pair were heading west. Stretch had contacts in the small Herefordshire town of Kington. For local man Mark Lloyd, it was a day he'll never forget. I've walked into the front room and Gary's just stood there by the guard, basically by the bulk of the door, staring at me. And as soon as I walked in, I thought, what, what the hell am I going to do now? And then, but whilst I'm thinking that, Joe's walked in behind me, come run in front of me, pulled the knife out, still covered in blood and skin and said, you must be Mark, you must be Barry. Gary's my driver, he does the disposing of the bodies. I've just killed three people and I want to do some more. Was he under her control? You like to say that he was under control. Oh, he did what she asked, but he still did it with free will. He was, there was no threats to his life. I mean, you know what I mean? Was, she wasn't holding a knife to his blade or his belly or anything. He just wanted to please Joe. By 3.30, they were in Hereford. More CCTV pictures show Dennehy and Mark Lloyd buying tobacco. Still armed, she sticks close to him in the shop. I walked into the shop, I'm instantly thinking that she's going to mug the, the girl behind her because the till was already open. And then she's basically asked the girl to turn around and comment on it, that she's got a very nice backside. I kind of felt, OK, we, we got through that one. I gave him money over for the cigarettes, we come back in the car. What I had to do, I had to, I had to convince these two I was on their side and all the same time inside, I was thinking, I need to get your call. How do I get you caught? How do I get you caught? But the next man's got to have a dog. The next man's got to have a dog. Initial reports to the police were sketchy, but for one crucial detail about the attacker from the victim himself. What was key was the piece of information that Mr Bereza was able to give us, and that was the fact that Joanna Dennehy had this distinctive tattoo on her cheek. Um, officers very quickly made the association between the earlier request from Cambridgeshire 
as Superintendent Ivan Powell briefs his officers on the ground about the two suspects, trauma doctor Nick Crombie is already flying to the stabbing scene in the air ambulance when a call comes in that there'd been another one. To get multiple casualties over a very short period of time, the anxiety was very much that this would turn into a, a, a what we call a marauding event where someone is going around repeatedly attacking more and more people um, such that it starts to overwhelm the services available. The two attacks were nine minutes and only a few streets apart. 56-year-old John Rogers had been walking his dog and fitted the profile Denner he wanted. Joe said, yeah, yeah, he'll do. And Gary's parked up by a bus stop. She's walked straight up to him. With a, the bloke's got his back turned to it and just literally launched into it. I suddenly felt what I thought was a really heavy punch in the small of my back. And when I turned round, I saw this woman and she just kept stabbing me in the chest. And this man did try fighting back, but it was a frenzy. Could you hear anything? Could you hear what was going on? Did you hear what she was saying? She was just saying, more, more, more. Got to do some more, got to do some more. She also said, oh look, you're bleeding. I'd better do some more. Um, I think I said, oh, just leave me alone, please. Please leave me alone. But she didn't, she just carried on. Both men were left for dead. Mr Rogers with almost 40 stab wounds. Dennehy even took his dog as a trophy. They drove off from Golden Post and parked up in an area of Hereford known as the Oval. By the time Dennehy, Stretch and Lloyd had reached here, Superintendent Powell had every man on the ground he could muster. And in the end, she didn't make it that difficult for them. In fact, she casually went for a walk with Mr Rogers' dog, giving both Gary Stretch and Mark Lloyd the chance to bail out. At 4.10, armed police found her sitting alone in the car. She was arrested without a struggle, Mark Lloyd soon after. Because she got arrested and taken into the custody suite with me. The last thing I remember Joe singing was, they've asked, have you got anything to say, Joe and Danny? And she's just broken into a tap dance and started singing, singing in the rain. That's the last I, ever, that's the last I saw of Joe. At 5.45pm, Stretch gave himself up to armed officers in Almley Village, 16 miles away. Dennehy's violent rampage was over half an hour after it began, but it was several days before Mr Baretza and Mr Rogers were out of danger. It's changed my outlook a little bit in, in that, you know, I think, I think you've got to make everything of every day because you don't know. You could wake up in the morning and get run down by a bus, you know, it's, you don't know what's around the corner. So I try to make the best of, of every day. Considering their horrific injuries, both men have made a remarkable recovery. Police, though, are still working to calm the fears Joanna Dennehy brought to Hereford. The sense that the investigation team have is that had Joanna Dennehy not been arrested when she was, she would have gone on to commit a further offence against somebody in the street in Hereford. Mark Lloyd still has nightmares about the serial killer. And this whole episode just sounds like something out of some movie, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't sleep at night anymore anyway. But it's just, uh, I'm just glad Joe went guilty, because I wasn't looking forward to seeing her in court. After such violence, Dennehy appeared calm in custody. She's since been diagnosed with a psychotic personality disorder and admitted the three Peterborough murders and the Hereford stabbing spree. Stretch always denied being her willing accomplice, but the jury found him guilty of attempted murder.